most uh, recognisable images of Edinburgh we have the Scott Monument. The Scott Monument was built to commemorate the life and works of Sir Walter Scott. Sir Walter Scott was born in 1771 in the old town of Edinburgh. He was a lawyer by profession, but he also became a best-selling author. In fact, he is credited with being the first international best-selling author in the world. The monument itself is 200 feet and 6 inches tall and was designed by a self-taught architect called George Michael Kemp. Uh, we hope in the future to open it to the public. It has been up until the, the uh, lockdown, the COVID outbreak, it was open to the public. There are 287 steps in the monument. There are four viewing platforms. The top one, as I say, accessed by 287 steps. There are 67 statues on the monument. And it's similar to a lot of things. Uh, every time you count them, you get a different number. You either miss one out or you count one twice or whatever. It's that sort of thing. Uh, the statue of Scott himself in the base is actually uh, of Carrara marble, the very expensive stone uh, from the Tuscany area of uh, Italy. Uh, the same material that uh, Michelangelo carved his statue of David in the uh, It was actually, it was actually produced by Sir John Steele. Sir John Steele, a very prolific. Art, uh, artist in Edinburgh. In fact, there is another uh, example of his work just coming up, the statue of Queen Victoria on top of the Royal Scottish Academy. Uh, it's interesting, that statue, because it's a young Victoria. Now, a lot of the statues you see of Queen Victoria were erected to celebrate her becoming Empress of India. And uh, I'm not telling any tales out of school when I say she was a bit chunky by that time. But this is a young, slim Victoria. The, the two galleries, Scottish National Gallery and the Royal Scottish Academy, were done by were designed by William Henry Playfair. Uh, we'll see more examples of his work as we go round. But uh, the building at the top of the hill, you know, with the two square towers, you may have noticed it. That is the new College of Edinburgh University. You can see it there. Uh, that's where the Scottish Parliament sat from 1999 till 2004, when a new building was opened. And we're going to see that in detail later on in the tour. So that is the old town up there on the left hand side. And the first thing you notice is it's on a slope, a very steep slope. Uh, geologists have a name for that formation, they call it a crag and tail. The crag is of course the castle rock, and the tail was produced by a glacier about 35,000 years ago. Now the Ross Fountain, maybe just glimpsed it through the trees there, it was uh, actually presented to the, uh, the city by a gunsmith by the name of Ross. He found it in a, an art exhibition in Paris bought it, dismantled it, brought it to Edinburgh and reassembled it. We have St John's at the West End. Uh, you can see a very popular uh, venue. At one time they emptied the crypt of that uh, building and made it a coffee shop. It was called The Coffin. It's a very imaginative name. And we have is that a Episcopalian or Catholic? Uh, I thought that's uh, Presbyterian. Oh, Presbyterian. Yeah. So we have uh, St. Cuthbert's. I'm not entirely sure what that one is. Uh, that could be Catholic. I'm not entirely sure, really. Uh, it's both it's street gardens. But if you look here, you can actually see how the castle has been built into the contours of the rock. You know, we didn't slice the top of the, I don't know, I've heard the places in Japan where they, they slice the top of a mountain and make a golf course. We didn't slice the top of that. In fact, if you go up to the castle, in certain places you're actually walking on the castle rock 
rather than a party. But it just shows you the the the, uh, the walls follow the contours of the rock. We'll see that again very shortly. Uh, on the left hand side we have the main concert hall in Edinburgh. We have one or two other theatres, but that's the main concert hall uh, in 2018. I performed in that concert hall and it was the first time in 20 years they had to open up the top tier. Such was Now the area within the defences was about one and a half square miles, two square kilometres. And the population by the middle of this 18th century, 1700s, was 55,000. To accommodate that number, we started to build some of the first high-rise buildings in the world. Some of the old wooden buildings in the old town of Edinburgh, as many as 14 storeys high. Thatched roofs. That makes fire a real problem. We've just come along Bread Street. That's where the bakers were sent. Outside the city wall, so that sparks from their open fires couldn't cause problems in the thatched roofs of Edinburgh. Now we're approaching stop three. Uh, I don't, don't think anybody's going to be getting off at stop three. Nobody does. I don't know why it's here, if I'm perfectly honest. But some people but there it is. Nobody leaving at stop three, Martin, we're okay. So now we get to talk about the, the castle. First of all, the word about the rock. As I said, it's a volcanic block, 350 million years old. The material is basalt. And now, a lot of people uh, associate basalt with the hexagonal columns of rock uh, in Finkel's cave and uh, the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland. But this is it in its raw state. That's, that's basalt in its in more usual state, if you like. This is where Edinburgh started. We do not have a port of our own. The Port of Leith did not become part of Edinburgh until about 1924. It's completely separate. This is why we're here. Dunedin, the fortress on the hill and there have been people living in the top of that hill dating back to the Iron Age. Possibly even the Bronze Age, but we know for certain the Iron Age. Oh well that's good to know. That's good. Well you're going to get in the back there, there's a lot of people going to fall asleep if you can see it. Uh, so, the oldest building in Edinburgh, St Margaret's Chapel is up within the confines of the castle. Four large windows. These are the windows of the Great Hall of Edinburgh Castle. Next to that we have the Royal Apartments. We have the Half Moon Battery coming into view shortly. The oldest gun emplacement in the castle. Uh, we have the National War Memorial, the Stone of Destiny, the Coronation Stone of Scotland, Shakespeare's Macbeth, a real character, a real King of Scotland, was seated on that stone to be crowned. We have the grandstand for the Royal Military Tattoo, Edinburgh Tattoo. Uh, 10,000 seats up there, and it's full to capacity every night, except Sundays for three weeks. A wonderful place to visit. It does take a while to get around. A lot of people can't spare the time to go around the castle. But even if you only have half an hour, it's well worth the walk up to the castle, over the Esplanade, and just have a look at the front. The gatehouse, you can see the march where the portcullis would come up and down. Protected by our great warriors from the Wars of Independence, Sir William Wallace and King Robert the Bruce. Robbie Bear. Sorry? Robbie Bear. Robbie Bones? Yeah. No, 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 nothing to do with the castle and Robbie Bones. Uh, no, uh, Robert the Bruce was king of Scotland there. Uh, uh, and he was king of Scotland at the time of the Battle of Bannockburn. One of the only times we beat the English in battle. 
you mentioned Robbie Burns though, but just behind this building here, <laughs> just behind there is the Writers Museum and it has artifacts of Burns, yeah. Stevenson and Sir Walter Scott. You get enough here sir? Right Mark, we have people leaving us. The building there is one one of the oldest buildings in Edinburgh. Not the oldest, but one of them. Uh, the sign says 1617, and that is when Thomas Gladstone bought that building. But it was actually built round about 1550. And that's ice, great ice cream there. Uh -huh. Best I've had. <laughs> so there we are. Rabbi Burns lived in a house. Just behind these buildings, the lady mentioned Rabbi Bones, our great uh, poet. Thank you so much. Okay. So this is the lawn market, the linen market. Now that is controversial because a lot of people say that this is the land market and that all the goods from the land are sold here. But I, I don't agree with that. Because we have a grass market, we have a fruit market, we have a vegetable market, we have a fish market, we have a flesh market. Why do we need another food market? I have a picture, or at least I have a book, that I found in a junk shop. And it's the strangest book you've ever seen. There is no author, there is no publisher, there is no date. All there is, is a title, Edinburgh, a medieval Manhattan. Uh, George IV, the first British monarch to visit Scotland, uh, he visited in 1822. The first monarch of Britain for over 170 years to visit Scotland. Just coming up on the left hand side, we'll see a fleeting glimpse of the old Parliament Hall of Scotland. There it is with the, with the uh, Jacobean windows there. And just to prove that this is a bridge, again looking to the left and down, you will see the Cowgate, the drove road into the markets of Edinburgh, going under the bridge. There is a small statue coming up, just in the, on the right hand side, this is a small dog called Bobby. Of course the, the story of Greyfriars Bobby is very well known. Uh, and it's been told in the same format for 150 years or so. You all know the story, a Sky Terrier sat in the graveyard beside his master's grave every day for 14 years. And two weeks ago, a man from Canada published a book and said he wasn't a Sky Terrier. He's Canadian for God's sake, how the hell did he know? He claims the breed was a Dandy Dinman. Now that's a Border Terrier, I'll grant him that. It was produced, the first bred in Selkirk. Route 30 miles to the south of Edinburgh, Sky Terrier originally came out of the sky about 250 miles away. But I'm, yeah, I'm not convinced that big is a Sky Terrier. And I'm 70 years old, there's no way I'm going to change now. So here we are. Uh, we're coming very much into Edinburgh University territory now. The University of Edinburgh is the, the oldest university in Edinburgh. We actually have four. We're not, I mean, we're not that massive a city. We don't even have a million citizens. But we've got four universities. Four. The University of Edinburgh uh, started in the 16th century. Uh, Harriet Moore University gained its charter in the 1960s. Uh, Napier University, after John Napier, named after John Napier, who invented logarithms. I'm sure some of you remember doing them at school, horrible things. 
uh, and the Queen Margaret University got its charter just a few years ago. It came into its own during the pandemic, that is the, the, uh, the nursing university, that's where nurses go to, to start their education. McEwen Hall, the graduation hall of the University of Edinburgh and the old medical school. Now the medical school and the uh, Royal Infirmary, these are the Royal Infirmary buildings coming up on the left hand side, is situated now in a greenfield site to the south of the city. It's called Little France. The origins are lost in the midst of time. The most common uh, uh, the most common theory is that when Mary Queen of Scots returned to Scotland in 1561, she brought an entourage with her. Many of them were French. And they set up an enclave beside Mary's favourite country retreat, Queen Muller Castle, and that became known as Little France. Uh, the man who wrote the book, as they say, uh, Stuart Harris, he's not very sure about that, but uh, he wrote a book called The Place Names of Edinburgh. Uh, he does mention that story, but it's, it, he's not by no means convinced, put it that way. So this is the old university, the old infirmary. I wouldn't buy a, a house that used to be a hospital ward, I don't know about anybody else. But that's what they're doing. Is a school? Hogwarts. That is the building that uh, J.K. Rowling has in her mind's eye when she's uh, talking about uh, the Harry Potter stories. It's an in independent school, very, very expensive. <laughs> Give you an idea. If, when, when you have their entrance exams, you can apply to sit the exam. And I think it's the top four or the top five get a full bursary. That means everything is paid for, tuition, books, uniform, sports equipment, musical instruments, anything you need is paid for by the Heriot Trust. The next four or five get uh, an assisted place. Now my oldest son passed the exam, he was, I think he was number six, so he was offered an assisted place. Our contribution was more than I was paying for a mortgage. So you can imagine how much the full fees are. Uh, I can tell you my son did not go to that school. <laughs> However, it didn't make a difference to him. He went to the local comprehensive. Has anyone seen the, the Commonwealth Games a few weeks ago? No? Well, obviously with a, a big games programme they had to do lots of infrastructure, roads and he pulled down a big uh, flyover and built new roads and things. My son was the chief engineer in charge of that. And last year, he was invited to do a presentation to the United Nations and the Nigerian government on uh, the prospect of trying to clear up the Niger Delta, supposed to be the most polluted place in the world. So going to his local comprehensive did him no harm whatsoever. And his little brother, little brother, they're both six feet tall, uh, his little brother uh, is no uh, slouch either. He is head of computer science at another one of the independent schools here in Edinburgh. As you will have guessed, they get their brains from their mother. <laughs> Talking about their mother, I met her in that building. She was attending a Christmas party in there, and I was a DJ at the party. We've been married 47 years. Good for you. Congratulations. It's been wonderful. She lives in California, I live here, it's great. <laughs> now just in that building though, before it was built, it was one of the old wooden high-rise buildings of Edinburgh I was talking about. And in there lived two Irishmen, William Burke, William here. And to supplement their income, 
they decided to supply bodies to the medical school in Edinburgh. And the normal way of doing that is to go into graveyards and dig them up. They didn't do that. They were too lazy. They created their own, just where that office box stands, they murdered 16 people. I'll tell, I'll tell you the conclusion to that story later on. This is the grass market. This is stop uh, six. Anyone leaving the bus at stop six? There we have the White Hart Inn, said to be the oldest uh, hostelry in Edinburgh. Charles Dickens, when he visited Edinburgh, and he did quite frequently, he used to stay in that inn. Another pub coming up with an interesting history that you see at the last drop. Some people think it refers to the last drop of beer or whiskey in the glass. It doesn't. It refers to this area where the people sit around that square. That's the site of the gallows. When it talks about the last drop, it means the last drop. Now I'd like to go back to working here. As I said, they decided to supply bodies to the anatomy schools, and, but they couldn't find fresh bodies, so they created their own. Now they were caught, and when they were caught, they were sent for trial. At the trial, which took place on Christmas Day, 1828, William Hare turned King's evidence. That meant in exchange for his freedom, he pointed the finger at Park to remember the bodies had been dissected. There was no bodies, they couldn't prove anything. But here, pointed the finger at Buck. Buck was hanged in January 1829. Not only was he hanged, but he was ordered to be publicly dissected. Which is quite fitting, because that's what his victims faced. And then they went one stage further. They actually boiled the body until we could extract all the bones. Then they put them all together and made a skeleton. And the skeleton would be, the skeleton would normally hang in the old medical school. We're going to see it again. There is an anatomy uh, museum in that in that building, and it's not normally open to the public. But up until the 10th of October, in the National Museum, and that's our next stop, stop seven, there is a display, an exhibition called uh, Anatomy, a matter of death and life. And part of that exhibit is the skeleton of William Burke. And anywhere in Britain, I don't know probably the world, if you see that, you know that's an apothecary or a chemist. Now these signs are very, very important. Uh, one of the barber's pole. <coughs> the significance of the barber's pole cannot be underestimated because it's the sign not only of barbers but of barber surgeons. If you had something wrong, say you got a, a, a gangrenous toe and you go to the doctors, he doesn't cut it off, he doesn't send you to an infirmary, he sends you to a barber surgeon and the barber surgeon cuts off your toe. The school was started in 1727. The Guild of Barber Surgeons was incorporated, that means it was made legal, recognised in Edinburgh in 1505. So, so over 200 years before, we had a medical school, we had barber surgeons. So the next stop on the tour is in fact stop seven. Anyone leaving the bus at stop seven? Stop 7 is a stop for the National Museum of Edinburgh. 
And that's where you'll find William Burke's skeleton. Now the museum itself is free, but the exhibition on uh, anatomy is has a charge. This is to cover transport costs and insurance, security, that sort of thing. But the actual museum itself is free. Uh, lots of things to see in there. Uh, natural history, science and technology, all that sort of thing. Uh, Dolly the sheep, the first ever cloned mammal in the world. It's like a rhinoceros on steroids. It's got three horns. Uh, he was fascinated by that. The other thing that fascinated him was a guillotine. A machine for chopping off heads. 200 years before the French Revolution, we had a guillotine that's on display in there. <coughs> this will be here on the, the right hand side. This is the old College of Edinburgh University. Now, the, the university was founded on this site by James VI in 1582. This building dates to the late 18th, early 19th century and it replaced the old wooden buildings of the university. It is a working college, you can't go in and visit it which is a shame because one of the rooms in there, the Playfair Library, is absolutely stunning. But uh, it was designed by Robert Adam, it's a law faculty, it's a working college. The principal of the university also has his offices in there. You can, however, go into the quadrangle. It's built on a quadrangle and you, you can see the quality of the, the design produced by Robert Adam. Now we're going to turn left and we're going to go over another one of these hidden bridges in Edinburgh. This is the South Bridge and it's called the South Bridge because it goes from the Royal Mile south. Underneath the bridge are said to be the most haunted place in Scotland. There are 19 individual arches produce the South Bridge and these vaults are haunted. Now there's a church at the top, we're going to actually go up there, turn right down to John Knox house. Uh, it is a uh, very short trip down there. Uh, this was called the throne, what we got. There's always, a, there's always something going on here during the festival. Uh, a lot of these people just pitch up, do their thing. Um, if they're lucky, some people put some money in a hat or something like that. But uh, that's what happens in the Edinburgh Festival. You can't get a venue, you just do it in the street. So that church is called the Tron Church. And uh, Tron, everybody breathe in. The Tron was a giant waving. If you were a merchant bringing your goods into Edinburgh, your goods were weighed and you, your pack was weighed as you went out. And that way they could work out if you cheated your customers. So we are approaching John Knox house. There's your ransom boy. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, John Knox was a religious reformer. Uh, do you want to get off here? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we're not entirely sure of the connection to John Knox. We think he may have stayed here for a couple of weeks before his death. But that's what it's known as, John Knox House. Now the building in the corner, the, wood, the stone faced building with the wooden gable, that's the oldest. Thank you. Cheers, man. Thank you. That's the oldest uh, inhabited house in Edinburgh. Thank you. Cheers, man. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Uh, anyone from America on the bus? Oh, yeah. Right. That house, you see it in the corner, stone, wooden gable. The foundations of that house were laid 21 years before. Christopher Columbus tripped over America on his way to India. I'm not, I am not 
joking. He thought he was going to India. Don't say he discovered it, it wasn't lost. The Native Americans knew it was there. So did the Vikings, so did the Irish, so did the French. Everybody knew it was there. Where Christopher Columbus gets his idea that he discovered it, a lot of nonsense. In fact, the islands that he tripped over are called the West Indies because he thought they were slightly west of India. Pathetic. I don't know. I'm just saying that. Maybe he did discover that. I don't want to offend you. If you if you believe Christopher Columbus discovered America, then fine, that's okay with me. Uh, they were coming to the end of the world. Or at least that's what the people of Edinburgh called it. This was where Edinburgh finished and the cannon gate started. There was a wall. And it was a toll gate. And even if you lived in Edinburgh and you left to visit someone in the cannon gate, you had to pay to get back in. And the people in Edinburgh resented that. They wouldn't pay. So he wouldn't leave. I should have mentioned this earlier. If you look to the left and right as we go up and down this Royal Mile, you see small streets. Some of them are quite wide now. They've been widened. Yeah. But you have small entrances. There's one there and the courses and winds of Edinburgh. That's where the people live. Very few people lived overlooking the Royal Mile. They lived in these small narrow streets. Uh, the next stop is stop nine. This is for the Canning Gate Curve. The Canning Gate was this area it was a separate entity. It had its own uh, offices, it had its own officials, its own market, its own taxes, even had its own prison. Completely separate from Edinburgh. In fact, this is the toll booth. The offices at the top, the prison at the bottom, and this is the Royal Church in Edinburgh, the Canning Gate Club. That's where Princess Anne's daughter, Zara Phillips, got married a few years ago. The next stop is for the Holyrood area of Edinburgh. Uh, Holyrood takes its name from an abbey that was started in 1128 by King David the First. He built it as a place of worship. Anyone leaving for the Holy Week? Yeah, we got two people leaving us here. Uh, Mark. Thank you. Cheers, Holy the, the Abbey was built as a place of worship for Augustinian monks. They took on the mantle of teachers. They started to educate the sons of the Burgesses of Edinburgh, not the daughters, they didn't get an education, but the sons. Also, David I installed a piece of the cross on Jesus, a relic of the crucifixion, and that made this area a place of pilgrimage. You see the ruins of the abbey behind the palace. The, the oldest part of the palace, the part closest to the gate, was started in 1498 and it was a present for the future bride of King James IV. Now she was Henry VIII's sister and she was used to Henry's palaces in London. All we had as a royal residence in Edinburgh was two or three rooms up at the castle. James decided that was not suitable for his new bride and he started to build a palace for her here. The palace has been in, in marks and modernised over the centuries. Uh, the, the fountain in the courtyard presented to Queen Victoria by her husband, Prince Albert. Uh, all the royal families from way, way back have stayed in that palace. Mary Queen of Scots. All, both the Charleses, all the Jameses. Uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie. He wouldn't let him into Edinburgh at the time of the Jacobite Rebellion. He just came round the side, camped his army in the, uh, the park and stayed in the palace. Queen Victoria, 
stayed there. And of course, her present monarch, Her Majesty, a frequent visitor to Scotland, and that's where she stays. Now, this park at one time was a royal hunting ground, and in the year two, uh, sorry, 1999, Her Majesty presented the park to the people of Scotland. Yeah, you win, you get a coconut. Well, I get a coconut as well. You want it's a virtual coconut, they won't let you bring a bag of coconuts on the bus. But just consider yourself to have a coconut. What a lot of nonsense. Yeah, but that's a bigger. Crazy, isn't it? So we are now leaving the old town in Edinburgh. Just a recap, we started life as an Iron Age hill fort on the Castle Rock. Castle Rock, 350 million years old. We started to work our way down the slope, which was left after a glacier retreated 35,000 years ago. Multi-story building. By the middle of the 18th century, that's exactly what it was. The solution to that was to build a new town. We didn't pull the buildings down, we didn't renovate them. It became the Royal High School in Denmark and it still exists today. This is one of its uh, former homes. It's actually uh, still going, it's in a, a campus to the west of the city. It's thought to be the 16th oldest school in the world. We have the uh, third gate of the Edinburgh Volcano. Uh, we have a monument to Admiral Lord Nelson at the top. It's not just a, a monument though, it's a time signal. There's a ball, a time ball at the top. Gets raised to the top of the mast at one o'clock when we fire our famous one o'clock gun, it drops. And this is so that ships in the front of the fort can set their chronometers. St Andrew's house. There used to be a prison on that site. If you look through the trees, you see what appears to be a small castle. That was the governor's house. That was the, it's the only part of the prison that's still standing, and that was where the boss stayed. Now, I mentioned the one o'clock gun. We fire the one o'clock gun at one o'clock. The ball drops from the top of that building. But if you look at that clock tower, The time will say five past one. Now there's nothing wrong with the clock. The clock is very, very accurate. It was installed in the, the hotel when it was opened in 1901. But it's five minutes past. And the reason for that is it's a railway clock. And before people could afford their own watches, you maybe had a clock in your house, but you didn't have a watch or a, a timepiece about you. You'd arrive at the station with your timetable. Your timetable says your train to Glasgow is five minutes past two. And you look at the station clock and it says four minutes past two. Uh oh, I'm going to miss my train. So you run down to the station and you get down there and the platform clock tells you you've got five minutes to spare. The original name of the hotel was the North British Hotel because it was built by the North British Railway Company. So, the Hotel Edinburgh Castle Rock was built the area between ourselves and the old town, the valley, is flooded. Now when it was first flooded in the 15th century, it was a lovely place. People swam in it, people sailed on it. But now it is quite simply a stagnant sewer. Disgusting. The wooden buildings of the old town are beginning to crumble and the, the town is built in such a way that if one goes it takes the whole street with it. Disease is rife and we don't mention modern diseases in the records. We go all biblical. It's a plague. 
it's a uh, miasma, fever, pestilence. But knowing the conditions up there, we can guess. It's probably uh, cholera, typhoid, dysentery, typhus fever, that sort of thing. Things are so bad, we start to develop a new town. Now the new town we have today is based, or the first phase, is based on a plan by a man called James Craig. And he devised a grid system. Two squares, uh, three east to west residential streets, yes. Believe it or not, Quincy Street was residential. I know it's got shops down, but it was residential. And I'll show you, I'll prove it. Well, not proof, but I'll show you what it looked like when it was first built. So there's three east to west streets, two service streets, that's the entrance, the servants' entrances to the new houses, the carriage houses, um, and some service industries like uh, um, tailors and dressmakers, that sort of thing. And seven north to south streets. A grid system. Now the streets mainly have Hanoverian names. I say mainly, there are one or two exceptions, but mainly they have Hanoverian names. And this is uh, an attempt by Edinburgh to prove our loyalty to King George. Now in 1745, Bonnie Prince Charlie arrived in Scotland from France, put together an army and attempted to overthrow the House of Hanover. He was uh, the grandson of the old pretender. James the, would have been uh, James the Eighth, James the Third of England. It was a complete, we gave them all Hanoverian names. So we have, we have Princess Street, named after Prince George, Prince of Wales, and Prince Frederick, Duke of York. Then we have George Street in the middle, the most prestigious and the widest street in the new town named after the king himself, and to the north we have Queen Street, named after Queen Charlotte Sophia of Mecklenburg, the wife of King George III. And the, the side streets or the, the cross streets, uh, names like Frederick Street, Hanover Street, that sort of thing. Uh, there is one of the exceptions coming up very shortly actually, and you will you'll see that. The two squares were intended to be named after the patron saints of Scotland in the east, England in the west, but we already had a George Square in the old town of Edinburgh. So again, the square was named after Queen Charlotte, Charlotte Square. So I, I mentioned that uh, there is one of these uh, exceptions, the name is uh, not of Hanoverian origin, and it's just coming up now, and then you'll, you'll understand why. If you look to the left hand side, what can you see? Edinburgh Castle. Guess what we call that street? Castle Street. We were up all day thinking about that one. Um, so we're heading, we're heading into Charlotte Square. Charlotte Square uh, was designed in its entirety. You getting off here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mark, we have people leaving at uh, uh, Charlotte Square here. 